The long-awaited history of San Jose Japantown was warmly greeted by the community on November 29, 2014. 100 people came to the book launch and were rewarded with signed editions from the authors. Entitled San Jose Japantown, A Journey, the elegant yet massive 500-page chronicle of Santa Clara County's longtime multi-ethnic community is the work of a five-person team including author Kurt Fukuda, co-author Ralph Pierce, project lead Jim Nagareta, designer Janice Oda, and editor June Hayashi. Kurt Fukuda shares with us the beginnings of the project. Uh, okay, so um, the CD-ROM, pro at that time, which was late 90s, I was really into video, storytelling, and uh, new technologies, and, I, and, and so I was really excited by this immersive technology which, where you can navigate through a virtual world. And of course now we have like Google Earth, so it's like almost passe. <laughs> But at that time, it was so new, and I, I, it really excited me about doing, I just wanted to do some sort of project. And I don't know what, what happened, but J San Jose Japantown came into my mind at that time, and I thought, that's perfect. It's not too big. Uh, it has a lot of uh, great buildings, like the Buddhist uh, church, um, and... Uh, and so I decided to start uh, photographing in San Jose, Japan town to create this like virtual reality tour. And then at the same time, uh, I, I thought, you know, okay, so you're navigating through this world, but wouldn't it be great if you clicked on a building or clicked on in a location and it opened up a little quick time movie. And in that movie, you, I would, I, I imagine having someone like, uh, uh, Dr. Ishikawa, who, who I had footage of, talking about the history uh, of that building or of the people who lived in the neighborhood. And I thought that'd be great and it could be put on a CD-ROM and you could put it in your computer and there you'd have the history of Japantown. So I was really excited about it. I went and I talked to Jim Nagareta, who was I, I had gotten to be friends with uh, throughout the 80s. Uh, and got him interested in the project and so we would go out uh, Sunday mornings early because we figured there's not too much traffic and stand in the middle of the street with our tripod and do these 360 degree panoramas that we stitched together. Started by taking, standing in the middle of the street taking photos of all the different businesses and we trying to do panoramics and at that time you know it was before Google and all that and so at that time, you had to stitch the photos together. So we would take multiple photos at, kind of in a circle, and then we were going to stitch them together. But as we were doing this, um, you know, we thought we'd have a DVD with a little booklet on the history of Japantown. And that booklet just kept growing and growing to the point where it was kind of a, the CD was kind of a more of a, after afterthought, you know, it would it turned into a book with a CD in the back. Designer Janice Oda was responsible for the rich and elegant format of the book. And initially, I was thinking, oh, very minimalistic, something that had a very almost Asian feel to it. And then I think it really developed out of once we really saw the materials coming together, how much text there was, and how much I mean, really. Because we had started with a CD jacket, and then it was going to be a, you know, eight-page pamphlet, and then it was going to be, you know, over the years when you start seeing how much was written, and, you know, Kurt at one point says, "I have 800 pages of text," and we're just, I mean, we were overwhelmed, and we had thousands of photos to go through, and so from there, I knew it wasn't going to be something very <laughs> clean with a lot of white space. It was going to have to have a lot of. Uh, a lot of, uh, I guess, content on each page. Kurt brings out the important role local living treasure Jimmy Yamaichi played in the creation of the book. A word got out that we were doing a, a project that involved a Japantown history, and uh, Jimmy, Jimmy heard about it and came to us. 
and uh, encouraged us to uh, continue the project. And he, he actually made a donation. He gave us some money so we could buy a scanner because we didn't even have a scanner to scan photographs. So he, he uh, donated some money to the project. And he also had me come out with him to meet uh, many, many Nisei who grew up in the neighborhood. And so Jimmy was really, really played an important role of laying, laying down the foundation of, of interviews. Yes. Uh, the other person was uh, the late Dr. Uh, Tokyo Ishikawa. So I was really lucky in that the 1980s I got to meet and get to know Laura Watts, who was the uh, Japantown Business uh, Association, uh, I guess she was the ex director or manager? Yeah, I remember her. She was wonderful. And so she actually hooked me up with Dr. Ishikawa. And a couple times when Dr. Ishikawa went out to, uh, he would give he would give Laura and I a personal walking tour and had all these stories. And I got to videotape Dr. Ishikawa and audio tape him at the same time. And many of his stories served as the basis for um, for our for the book, what he appears in the book. And of course, you know, uh, everything Dr. Ishikawa talked about, I would verify by going to city directories. I, I would look up things that he would talk about and, and you know verify that they were they were true because you know no one's perfect and sometimes our memories play tricks on us. But Dr. Shikawa was incredible. Well, anyway. Of course, the first thing we asked Kurt was for the stories he could not put into the book. It will come back to me as soon as you turn off the camera. Um, we went to interview her because her father was one of the real early leaders of San Jose Japantown. He, he was in Japantown in 1906. He came down from San Francisco after the earthquake. So we were all ready to interview her. And we knocked on her door and she opened the door and she looked at Ward and she looked at me and she said, oh, I thought you were gonna be a lot younger than you are. <laughs> that was no hello, just, you know, oh. <laughs> And so we went into her house to interview her, and she had a lot of, like, in her entryway, there was a picture of her brothers with, with uh, Norm Mineta. They were all like little boys sitting on the porch, and I go, oh my gosh, that, oh, June Kimura, that's it, June Kimura, that's who we're interviewing. And I go, that's a great picture. That would be great for our book. And, and June was gr great. She was, she would, she'd like always just change the subject. As soon as I would see something like, oh, June, you know, before I could even ask her, could we borrow that picture? She would just like change the subject. So she had a lot of pictures that n never got into the book because I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why. But there is a picture of her and her brothers and Norm Manette and they're sitting on the porch on 3rd Street. It's little boys. It's a fabulous picture that didn't that get into the book. Picture. So who else didn't get into the book? Like there was this one person who I won't, I won't give his name, who I asked him, where, where did you get your name from? Because it's not a Japanese name. It's more of an American nickname. And uh, he, he told me, well, he said, when I was 14, some of the guys here in Japantown and I, we, used to, we went out to Bascom Avenue. He goes, that's where all the uh, house of prostitutions were. And he goes, <laughs> he said, the prostitute I was with, that was her name. And so that became my nickname. <laughs> so <laughs> obviously that story didn't get into the book. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> but there, there were a lot of, there were, like uh, there were a lot of, fun stories that I just, you know, were just great, but I, you know, I, I couldn't put it into the book because then, so for me, that was a, a great story that had to be told in the book about how, you know, it, it, the Sanseis, one of the reasons why Japantown was able to move on after the 1970s was that the Sanseis did, did take an interest in the community. They were interested in Japanese American, uh, culture and and they were channeling their activist energy into the community and so that that was really I, I felt an important story 
to tell, and and I I, I I need to I need to throw in one thing before I forget. You know, one of the reasons why I, uh, that really spurred me about putting in the story was uh, in the 1990 centennial. There was a booklet that that came out with the centennial, and in the booklet there was a two-page history of San Jose Japan Town, which is a wonderful history. But you know, if you read it. It's like all about the settlers and then the internment. And then the very last two sentences of, of, the, of these, this two-page history is, after the internment, the Japanese returned to San Jose and resettled in Japantown. The end. And as a, as a sansei, I went, what? <laughs> you know, two, 50 years of Japantown history in two sentences? And so, I I remember you know talking with Jim Nakareta about it and I, and he he and I both agreed yeah our, we're gonna the one thing we're gonna make sure about the book is it it's not gonna just you know just give two sentences to the last fifty years but actually talk about what happened what's happened in Japantown since the resettlement. So Ralph Pierce tells us about the beginnings of San Jose Japantown. That the old China down. Chinatown burnt down and it was forced to move out and John Heinlein was kind enough to to have this uh, uh, Chinatown built uh, on the outskirts of town. Uh, it was in a good location too because it was in a spot where where immigrant newcoming workers they would have some refuge and a place to be and, and kind of left alone and they would be close to the factories and the fields where they were getting work so it was it was a, it was a good spot for them. And, and, and was part of what encouraged the survival, I think, uh, of, uh, of, of Japantown. And the fact that San Jose wasn't, wasn't too big or too small. You know, as we've seen with the small Japantowns, they've just kind of uh, uh, mostly evaporated. Uh, and with the, bigger, with the bigger cities, Los Angeles, San Francisco, they get kind of taken over and, and redone. Uh, so ours is, you know, ours is pretty unique, I think. Uh, well, the, I would say the short answer is uh, I had just finished the, uh, the book on the San Jose Asahi and Zebra's uh, baseball team for the, for the museum, for the Japanese American Museum. And uh, that was in, uh, I guess our book launch was like in July of 2005. And I went a few months and I was kind of looking around thinking, wow, you know, I've, I've actually done a book. I could do another one, you know. So um, I was kind of looking around for a while and thinking about different things. And one of the main people that uh, sold the Asahi book in J-Town was Jim Nagareda. And one day I took some books down uh, to Jim and, um, for the museum. And he said, you know, would you have any interest in helping us out with a book about Japantown? He says, my friend Kurt Fukuda. And right away I recognized Kurt's name because I had met him years before. Um, through a mutual friend, Lisa Jones. Um, and so I said, yeah, whatever I can do. You know, I, I immediately recognized that, um, that the book was, you know, would be important not only locally for local history and local Japanese American history, but, but also on a, a, a national scale, you know, on a, on a bigger scale, being one of just a few Japan towns remaining and really perhaps uh, the only one that's been basically unchanged. So we ask Ralph, who else lived in Japantown? It's attached to the Kogura uh, gift shop and it's a very historic building having had the very first Japanese businesses uh, there, uh, very early Filipino businesses and it was actually built for Chinese uh, tenants initially at the same time as Highlandville. So it's, it's a little brick building and uh, uh, we have we have three Chinese buildings remaining. That little brick building on the corner of uh, Sixth, on the northwest corner of Sixth and Jackson. We have Ken Ying Lo, which I think all that survives of it is the the front of the building is being rebuilt. And then there's another building further down on the other side of the Filipino Community Center, which was the Hip Sing Tong building, which I believe was b built after the war. It also reflects Chinese uh, uh, architecture as well. Um, the Hori building, uh, building that I uh, lived in, the midwifery, another building that's burnt down. 
Um, and that was a very early... Um, Where was that located? That was at, I believe it's 580 uh, North 5th Street. That was right next to just a, a, a lot south of the old Walnut Factory. Um, and, uh, you know, just north of the Wesley Church. And that was the old midwifery. They've rebuilt it on this, the, the building on the same footprint, though the profile is a little bit lower. Um, but I lived there briefly in the late uh, 1980s, and I, I began doing research on it. You know, I was working at the library already, and I started doing research on it just out of curiosity who lived in this house before me. Um, and when it built, burnt down, by the way, um, we got permission from the owner to go in and try and salvage some materials. And one of the items that I salvaged from the building I don't know if you can see it too well with the take it out because of the glare. I, I because of the um, all of the water uh, from when they put the fire out, it allowed me to peel off layers of wallpaper till I got to the original wallpaper. And this is a piece of the wallpaper in the hallway uh, of the building um, from from 1915. From, the... from 1915, yeah. When, when, the, when the buildings were moved from Grant School and joined together, two classrooms joined together to create a long house. And the midwifery was in the back. And one of the things I did also was save the, um, the clawfoot bathtub that, that was in the house. And, and it occurred to me, people thought I was crazy, you know. I was over there by myself, no one else was interested. And I pulled this thing out, I pushed it out a window and then had a friend come down and, with his truck and we moved it and saved it and then later gave it to the museum. And I'm hoping that they'll put it in the Kawakami house next door. That's what they said that they were planning on doing with it. But it just occurred to me that this is where those babies, a generation of Nisei babies would have had their first bath. They would have been rinsed off in this tub. Uh, and uh, we already have a description of, of this particular bathroom being filled with medical equipment and equipment related to the to the midwifery. I was actually starting to feel like it was very utilitarian looking at one point and then uh, we asked Tamiko Rast for some help just to kind of see what kind of how she sort of would envision so I asked her for like a, a sample template of what she thought it could look like and she gave me some great ideas for adding a little bit of Asian texture and yeah, that's I mean, actually where the little strip came from I was the Asian strip looks a lot yeah work. it's I mean, totally her so, so that's, that's very interesting yes so. yes and yeah. she's so very generous to do that for us but yeah because Ooh, at some point I thought, can we ask Tomiko <laughs> to do this? Because I was really nervous. I've never done a book and I, and you know, honestly, no matter how awesome your photographs and your text and everything is, if you don't put it together right, it doesn't, doesn't work. And so we were, I was really nervous about that. And, hmm. No, I just, I think more than anything, I wanted it to look important. Um, have a feel that it had value. And I think that's why I chose kind of very traditional, almost heavier kind of colors that I felt like made people feel like there was a substance to, to what was in the book. And that's, I think, why I went with that direction and that, you know, as far as layout though, I mean, it really was driven by how much text and how much how many photos and there were definitely areas that you know it got so photo driven that there was almost no text and that was very difficult to kind of maintain the story going versus ones that were like all text so it was a lot of that was driven by that i mean i created a template but even that template sort of <laughs> mm -hmm. got a lot modified quite a bit over <laughs> over the chapters so we all stayed friends. This is a really good thing. <laughs> That's number one, pretty good point. Yeah, I mean, because it was, there was tough years, but you know, I think the best part of it all was that we kind of became almost, not a family, but kind of like a family. We went through so many things together, births and deaths and marriages and uh, everything. And, you know, and it, yeah, some years we took off because someone had a baby. Or, you know, and so we've really grown together. I mean, I didn't even have a family when we started, and Kurt didn't either. And, uh, 
and Jim had one business, <laughs> you know, and now he's got whatever. Yeah, we really, we really, you know, this was all volunteer work, and it was all not-for-profit, and we chose the Japanese American Museum to, as a publisher because we felt like they would benefit the most, they service the whole community, and, um, and, uh, and so, and archivally, I mean, I think all our materials will basically live there. June Hayashi, who edited the final copy, talks about her involvement. Yeah. So as an editor, um, I, for this project, um, I checked the manuscript for errors in punctuation, grammar, inconsistencies, spelling, redundancies, and then I checked for word usage and syntax. And then I also uh, set up the glossary um, notes at the end of every chapter to help if students are referencing things. In, the index, now the index was done um, by Ralph and Janice because they use the software. And also um, I did uh, some of the fo uh, credit lines and captions for the photos. So as each chapter was completed then they give it to me and then I do go over all of these things. It was interesting. Um, I found that each one of the team members, I was sort of like behind the scenes and uh, there were other team members that were more uh, in the community and, and were interacting more with the community and um, I was really impressed with their work. Um, Jim had his connections with the business community and he was also involved with the Japanese American Museum uh, members and um, that was a very big plus for all of us. And also Janice, she was, she did the beautiful design and um, was always involved with things with deadlines, you know, if you asked anybody to help, she was always ready. And she took all the responsibility, or most of it, for the, um, uh, the printing. And there were a lot of deadlines of, associated with that. So she was pretty good under pressure, I'd say. And Ralph and uh, the two authors, they were amazing. You know, um, Kurt, of course, was our leader and he set the tone and he always had a um, even keel approach to things and a sense of humor and Ralph who came in later was so on the ball you know with keeping us on schedule and he tackled if there was a, a something amiss he he would be the one to notice the struggles and um, the achievements that the, the people made. There's so many, and every story could almost be a, a mini book. Um, so I think that's what fascinated me, was the personal side of the story of Japantown. We went to Jim's studio to ask him how he coordinated the project. <laughs> project lead is kicking everyone's butt and telling them to get their stuff done and trying to set schedules and you know setting meetings so that people have deadlines um, you know if there's a lead that could be followed up you know that's I'm in Japantown so it's easy for me to go around and ask people um, you know who is this person in this photo or do you know so and so and um, so the project lead you know wears many different hats but mainly trying to keep the project moving forward. Um, you know, since I've been around, I, I know a lot of the people in the area, um, but I would say that I was most impressed with uh, actually how 6th Street was kind of the center of the community. And there were, you know, Chinese people, Filipinos, and African Americans. Um, but if you look at 6th Street now, it seems kind of dead. But many years ago, that was the, um, uh, what we would 
kind of think of as Jackson Street now with, you know, it was on 6th Street. And so that was very interesting to me because I hadn't seen that part of Japantown. So that, yeah, it was, uh, we purposely kept the team small because we wanted to um, be able to work at our own pace and, and you know, everyone's got different ideas. And so we just had to be sure that everyone had the same focus and same ideas. And uh, luckily everyone's really nice. Everyone's got the same, everyone knew what the reason was for us to complete this book. And we all had that same focus. And that's, I think, what brought us all together was that we wanted to document uh, Japantown and we wanted to leave this for future generations to uh, also enjoy. And finally, we asked Jim what he got out of this Japantown book project. So many things, um, mainly that everyone really cares about the community. Um, everyone cares about the history. There's so much that has gone on. People want to preserve the area. Um, you know, you notice that we still don't have um, a lot of big corporations in the area, which is great. It's still pretty much mom and pop, which makes this area so unique. Um, and just everyone knows each other. It's so great to be able to walk down the street and say hi to everybody. And uh, you pretty much feel safe in the area. and. Uh, it's great that the community groups are here to have um, uh, events like the Niki Matsuri and the Bon and things like that. So it's just a great area to be around, and and you know I even live in the area and I just love it. You know it's just it's just so fun to be here.